When people hear the word Mac, they usually think expensive and in many ways pointless. But what if I told you that my favourite Mac ever released by Apple is neither of these two things. This right here is my personal favourite type of Mac that has ever been released. The eMac. This specific version of course is the 2003 model which is one of the most common options available over here in the UK as it fixed a lot of people's complaints related to graphical power with the previous 2002 model. Released under codename Northern Lights it comes with a PowerPC G4 processor clocked in at 800MHz with one single core. Because this one's from an educational environment it's been upgraded from 128 to 628MB of PC 133MHz RAM. However you can put up to a whole gigabyte in there if you really need to. One of the most noticeable upgrades over the original model was the move to an AGP 4 time slot and of course a Radeon 7 500, which worked much better than the GeForce 2 MX 200 that was originally used on the 2002 model. This of course powers the beautiful 1280x960 CRT screen which looks brilliant even today and I'd actually say it rivals my current monitors which are pretty decent. Our model comes with a CD-ROM drive and can run up to Mac OS X Leopard which is stored on the 40GB internal hard drive. Not to mention the host of ports on these models which actually make it surprisingly easy to cable manage and have a completely clear setup. So after I'd got this thing set up for the first time in years the next thing I wanted to do was actually get an up to date web browser ready to browse the internet. As Safari worked but wouldn't display websites right whatsoever and Firefox that was pre-installed and even old than Safari, although spewing out errors every 2 seconds, was actually able to load a few websites and I was able to download a port of the newest version of Firefox, namely 10.4 Fox. Which although I say is a newer version of Firefox, it's a few versions out of date but browsed the internet pretty much fine. Oddly enough browsing the internet on a machine like this was pretty snappy as I was able to download the file, extract it and get a modernist browser all up and running in minutes. So you sort of get the idea that you can do everything you need to on the machine in terms of internet usage. But then we had an idea. What would you actually want to do if you had access to the full internet and you want to run something that you'd run on a modern machine? So what we did was we headed over to my YouTube channel, grabbed the Discord link and actually completed the captures which oddly enough loaded far too many times. We were able to get in, although very slowly. And once you're in and after about 2 minutes of loading everything does work as well as it should be. It's not exactly snappy and I wouldn't recommend trying to do much else on the PC while Discord is running as there was definitely some large slowdowns when images were posted and even emojis needing a loading time. Which isn't exactly something to say that it works well but you get the general idea. If you could do it on your main computer internet wise you should actually be able to do it here. It just won't be snappy in certain instances where you're using up the full processing power of the computer. However next up I did encounter my first issue with the eMac since I started using it again. See most forms of software for the PowerPC era Macs are after a certain point came solely on DVDs. And what does our eMac have? A CD-ROM drive, something that we'll actually be having to sort out later. See, there's a lot of freeware available online for PowerPC based hardware and given how good the machine was at browsing the internet it didn't feel like I was affected much at first, because I thought why don't we just fire up Firefox and find some software to use on the Mac online. However, compared to a few years ago when I last dabbled with PowerPC based computers, a lot of the old repositories have been shut down, moved or are now password protected. Many of the old abandonware sites still existed and a couple of enthusiast blogs were still around and made my life easier when it came to finding some gains that we could actually test on a system like this. Which brought me round to the end of my first day with the eMac in 2018. Day 2 began with finishing up the final downloads from the night before which included finding Halo Combat Evolved which proved to be the easiest bit of software available to download for the Mac. This eMac didn't exactly seem to utilise my full speed internet on any download I used as I know some of these sources download much quicker on my normal PC. As for actual games I fired it up to give it a quick test to make sure it was actually working which as you can see it was definitely working somewhat ok. But as we had finally downloaded all of the games my next bet was to try and find something to edit with, as there are definitely the likes of Final Cut which do exist for older Mac OS X versions and PowerPC architectures, but I found iMovie is much more accessible and easy to find. It did take me a little while to find a website that had iLife 6 available as the package includes iMovie which after a 3 hour download meant we could look into testing out some editing software. So with that all installed, how exactly does my favourite Mac ever fare with some day to day tasks? 
So I decided to dive in at the deep end with some video editing using iMovie HD6 which as I just mentioned is available quite readily in the iLife package. I decided to edit together some PS1 B-roll that I've recorded for a video I'll be featuring in, and editing was slow. Importing the files did take some time, but animations would play back in near real time as well as playback of the clips, admittedly not in full quality, and it wasn't a bad experience overall, but I could definitely see more intensive editing, with multiple layers being much harder than this, as the RAM is a limiting factor as well as the CPU itself. You could add a full gigabyte of RAM, but even then that would only help so much. So with a single core to edit with, overall not brilliant, but you can still get by with a £10 Mac. And it's better than the type of PC you'd probably end up picking for £10. After that I decided to test some music creation by just clicking random things in GarageBand. It worked well, there was no noticeable slowdown at all and I spent most of my time just messing around with it. But what I was doing was rather primitive in there compared to most audio editors that you'd actually use, but for basic messing around with with an Apple exclusive program, you can get away with doing this on one of the cheapest Macs you can find online. Admittedly the music you can make in this is only somewhat basic and there is actually a CD drive in the machine, so if you can make music, can you actually play it back? So you can definitely grab your favourite CDs and play them on the system, which works well. In this instance I used iTunes and it ended up sounding like this through the somewhat decent speakers. For high quality audio files I had a little bit of an issue. See iTunes won't actually open them, so what works with every file? VLC clearly. But unfortunately due to the weak CPU and how VLC utilises caching for high quality file playback, it will result in the system just skipping playback of the file no matter how many times you cache it or how much caching you allow the system to make. So I had to go back to the internet and see what other people were using for terms of audio playback, and found an audio player called Vex which utilises a very similar system to VLC and comes complete with a nice set of EQ options, which allowed me to fine tune the speakers on the eMac and allowed me to actually play some stuff back, which ended up sounding like this. You may remember from earlier that we couldn't actually get any of the main games to test installed because that CD-ROM drive. Well thanks to the best DVD-ROM drive that 2002 has to offer, which happens to be the only one I had lying around, I fired up the games and installed them, only taking one hour at a time, and it was time to get into some real gaming benchmarks. So firstly to warm us up with some benchmarks we have Halo Combat Evolved which started off completely fine and we were seeing a frame rate hovering around the 30fps region while using lower settings. Not too shabby for a cheap little Mac and it looked nice considering the CRT display and how things scale on it. But as soon as the action kicked in, now that's where things took a turn. We saw frequent drops down to single digits which brought down our healthy average to something that pales in comparison, namely a 12fps average with minimums down to 2 FPS. At least when we weren't in action you can sort of appreciate just how nice 30 FPS looks, but it wouldn't exactly appear that the GPU is performing very well here, as this sort of similar scenario would be expected if you use a Razeon 7000 series card on a Windows based system. From here I decided to test an indie game called Black Shade which still works on most power PC computers. It's relatively recent having come out in 2011, which is actually 7 years ago now, and you have to defend the president, and you sort of get the idea from there. It's a very basic game but it's actually very fun to play on the system, especially when you're hopping around that 60fps region, which is surprisingly nice considering how modern the game is and just how weak the GPU in this actually is. There isn't much in the ways of indie development that still supports the power PC, but generally fun little games like this do exist and most of them will run very smoothly, especially given the responsive nature of the CRT screen and how the graphics actually look on it. The likes of Minecraft ran… well as you can tell not great, loading took so long that I've sped it up for you guys, but it didn't crash which is nice. We saw an average of 5 FPS on average, which for those of you who grew up with low end computers during the 2011 to 2013 period would likely remember all too well. Oddly enough I would call this nostalgic, 
but it's nowhere near playable. I might have considered it playable back then, but not nowadays. I mean, it would refuse to load chunks, the frame rate was horrible and unstable, and don't even get me started on what would happen if you tried to open up the inventory. Altogether, Minecraft was not a good bet for game to run on the system, but if anyone was wondering why we're using such an old version, this is the newest version that supports the PowerPC architecture, as anything beyond 1.5.2 doesn't really like PowerPC systems and I'm pretty sure won't work. NextWiz operates on the Quake engine, which does support PowerPC based systems and should be somewhat friendly for an older PC. And I thought, hey, we've got a CRT and you cannot beat playing an FPS game on a CRT screen. So the furthest I could get the game was the loading screen, because regardless of whatever drivers I used, there was no hope in hell of getting the game to start. I tried multiple installs of the game, different versions, and it was just no way of getting it to work. So I may have to try and find something else to get it to work on, which could be time to investigate Linux on the eMac, but I'll save that for a later date as there's only so much we can fit in one video. Tribal Trouble, which is a city builder, real-time strategy-like game, was perfectly playable with a mixture of low and medium settings. It looked decent, and I'll be honest, I've never heard of this game yet alone played it. But it was fun, and you can zoom right in, see all the fine details and what's going on, and a few features are blocked off in the demo version of the game that I was using, but it's nice to see a game that I could actually see myself losing tons of hours to or running on an eMac like this, and it's definitely a game I'll have to investigate further, because I did enjoy playing it while I was using it on the Mac. Finally, we have Knights of the Old Republic, which worked fine. For the most part, though, combat isn't in real time, so I didn't mind the frame drops there. However, high player counts on screen or larger, more open areas would definitely cause frame drops down to the single digits, which looked like a slideshow, hence the minimum frame rates. Luckily, throughout my time playing, the frame rate did tend to stick around the 20 FPS region more so than not, which is similar to how the original Xbox got in the late game. Still not exactly an ideal experience, and I'm pretty sure the original Xbox didn't struggle in the beginning of the game, and it was very heavy stuff that did cause slowdown, unlike the very minor stuff causing such severe drops here on the Emac G4. Finally, we have Fable The Lost Chapters, which is a game on Mac that has caused a whole host of issues for me. Now, firstly, I placed the disc into my external DVD drive, and what happened next? Well, the capacitors blew on it. I mean, it's very old, that was sort of expected, but it meant I needed another way to get the game running as it won't run without the disc in place. So I ran down to my local tech shop, picked up the cheapest used DVD drive they had, plugged that in, and finally got round to benchmarking this game. A game that took me far too long to find in disc form. And did it work? Well, no it didn't. I mean, yes, we are using a rather weak Mac here, but the effort I went to just to watch a pixelated intro to Fable was probably not worth it. However, I do want to test this elusive port of the game more thoroughly at some point, but no, Fable Lost Chapters will not work on a 2003 Emac G4. So in conclusion, the £10 Emac, is it still my favourite Mac in 2018? Well, considering how cheap these things are, it definitely hits the need for computing on a budget. But nowadays, more so than ever, the internet is just getting slightly more bloated, and it shows on the eMac with some sites running much slower than usual. However, everything done in this video was downloaded and run on the eMac. The only external resources used were offline media for installing games, and all my media files used for editing were downloaded off my Google Drive, meaning file transfers and web usage on an independent device is fully viable on such an old Mac. Exclusive applications like iMovie and GarageBand also work absolutely fine. You get the full fat Mac experience while on a budget, while also having the option to resort to using some of those old Mac classic programs, which will also work in these Macs. You've got a lot of choice here, and you get to benefit from the high quality CRT, which has beautiful colours and a refresh rate that even I'm jealous of today, which is included across all the eMac G4s purely because they are a uniform part of the model. Sure, maintenance on them is a little bit hard because of this, and the early models like this one can't even utilise dual channel RAM, but personally the perks of this machine make up for it. Going back to my normal monitors feel sluggish in comparison, and they lack the fluidity in response to the CRT. So if you're a CRT enthusiast who wants to explore the Mac world, or maybe just someone interested in visiting when Macs were actually unique and meant something different, maybe you want to explore the PowerPC architecture and what a cheap way to do so. Either way, I'd recommend the eMac each time. Thank you very much for watching, good night. 
So this video was a rather large undertaking that I've been planning for a while now, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget you can always like and subscribe for more content like this and support us on Patreon for extra bonus content, and I'll have plenty more videos coming your way soon.